I hike Hughesy here and you probably gather from the fact that my hair is wet that I've been underwater. I'm out at the iconic Raysbury North Lake. What an absolutely beautiful place this is. Crystal clear water, some wonderful spots. And what we're out doing today is looking at casting accuracy. When you've found a spot with either your leading rod or alternatively your marker rod, how do you have to cast or where do you clip it up? to make sure that your lead and your rig is going bang on that spot. This is going to prove beyond all doubt exactly what you've got to do. And joining me on the bank to prove it is Lee Mosa Morris. Right, we've got the spot now, so what I want to do is make sure that I mark it up nice and accurately. So I'm just going to run the marker float down until it touches the lead. Just take it down to the deck. There it is, that's down. So pop it in the clip. That's marked the spot now, and I can bring it back in. And then what I'll do is I will just find out on the old marker sticks exactly how far out that is. So we'll know exactly to the centimetre how far out we're fishing. Standing just right by the side of the pod here. And if we cast from the same place, we'll know we're on exactly the right distance. 11, 12, 12 and three quarter wraps. So that is exactly the distance we need to be marking up. 12 and three quarter wraps. Now the first thing I'm gonna do there before I forget it is get that noted down in my swim mapper and I will remember exactly where it is for all future out towards the spindly tree. Take a quick photograph of the peg, mark it on the swim mapper. That's the spot sorted. Right then, now having got the depth, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this over and I'm gonna put a grappler on because it's all very well known that it's quite hard and also what the depth is. But what I want to know is what's on the bottom. Now I'm hopeful that it's sand, maybe a little bit of weed out there, but I don't know. And one of the ways that you can find out is just get the grappler lead out, run that through a couple of times, feel back and see what you get coming back on the tines of the lead. Out it goes, rod high, on the spot. Landed nicely and that felt quite sandy. Now these leads come in three, four and five ounce uh, sizes. So obviously the bigger heavy ones will get right down and drag through right in the bottom if you need them to. So, I'm just going to pull back a little bit and that's come straight back lovely. I reckon that's probably sandy down there. Just picking up a bit of stuff there now. And then, oh, now it's gone in the weed. So that's interesting. The marker float was pulling through that weed okay, but the grappler has immediately caught up on that weed that's just on this side of the spot. So that's a good indication actually as to what I should do with my line lay. Now, when I cast the float out and found that spot, in my mind I've got a lovely nice sandy flat bottom there but of course pulling the float back through it's just come through the higher fronds of the weed but when I've pulled this back just look at this big lump coming in that means that just this side of that spot there's a big weed bed now the marker float didn't tell me that at all whereas the grappler has and that will have a big effect like I say on line lay so there's the old grappler it smells quite nice that and interestingly if you have a look down in that weed down there, you'll see a load of mussels in it as well. So that is something else that will give me a little bit of an idea about how to set my bottom end of the tackle up. So, you know, just looking there, there's some sharp razor mussels in that weed. Something to think about for sure. Just going to ping it back out again. Out on the spot, nice and high, hit the clip, follow it down, feel it down on the deck. Crack, it fell down lovely. So that's twice now that it's gone through lovely. Quick pull back, it's bouncing nicely, and then watch this. Comes up, and that's when it hits the weed. Oh, great. So two pulls back, and that's told me everything that I need to know. Nice and clean on the spot. A load of weed just on this side of it. Well, that's 12 and three quarters. So I'm just gonna clip this one up and I'm using 
three identical setups now. I've got a torque two and three quarter pound test curve rod. This is the rod I use for a lot of my uh, short session work. Uh, FX9 reel and Nexus set line. And I've got three rods with that on that are all exactly the same. They've all got a four ounce lead on as well, but there is one difference between the leads and that is the color. And the reason there's a color difference is to allow me to see what they're like when I go down and dive down there. So we've got a yellow one, we've got a white one, and we've got an orange one. This one's gonna be wrapped at 12 and three quarters, which was the same as the float. The next one's gonna be wrapped at 13, which is the extra three feet as per the marker float coming up the surface. And the other one, uh, that one will be wrapped at 12 and three quarters again, but the way I cast will be slightly different. So what we'll do is we'll do three different casts now, pop the leads out there, and then I'll get the kit on, go down and have a look exactly where they are in relation to the marker float lead. So I made my way to the spot with some marker poles in my hand. I've got four poles wrapped with red and white tape to make a target area. The first thing I've done is to drop them. And as soon as I did, I realized that we might be in trouble. The poles haven't fallen flat on the deck, but have actually stuck into the silt and are standing upright. Not a good sign. I dropped down at the bottom and you can see here that all the poles are sticking upright. And that shows me there's a reasonable amount of silt on the deck and the spot maybe isn't as hard as I first thought it was. When I've landed, my suspicions are confirmed and the silt starts kicking up by my feet. I've then taken my fins off to see if I can reduce the disturbance, but unfortunately it's really light and starts lifting all over the place. In reality, this is a great place to fish, but not a very good place for the experiments that we were hoping to carry out. I looked around for the lead and saw a number of little spots in the silt, and then I found one of them buried a couple of three inches into the silt itself. It's a bit of a surprise really, because when I cast out, I felt the leads down and they did land with a reasonable donk. As we go further up the slope where the marker lead landed, it was a little bit harder, and of course the lead would have been cushioned a little bit and parachuted down with the weight of the float as well. Eventually, after grubbing around a bit, you can see another lead here, also buried in the silt. It just goes to show that it's really important when you're feeling the lead down, firstly to think not just about the donk, but what comes immediately before it. On old gravel pits like Raysbury, there's bound to be some silt here and there, and there was a lot more here than we originally thought. Also, when I cast my leads out, they landed firmly, but not with a hard crack, and that should have alerted me to the fact that the silt was a bit deeper than I'd originally thought it was. It was time to write the experiment off and find another spot. Lesson learned, be aware of silt. Okay, well, unfortunately, the spot that we found out in the lake is way too silty for Husey to film underwater, so we've had to find another spot which is to the right of the swim, it's at 13 and a half wraps. So I've got the marker float set up and I've chucked that out at exactly 13 and a half. I'm gonna get the other three rods in. We're gonna chuck one at 13 and a quarter. We're gonna chuck the other rod at 13 and a half exactly where the marker float is and another one at 13 and three quarters. So I'm gonna get them clipped up now, chuck them out in the spots and see what results we get. <laughs> So back to the new spot now, out with the post and you can see here I'm setting up the target area. The posts are 1.2 meter by 1.2 meters and I'm putting them right by the side of an area of weed which is right by the marker float. The marker float sat more or less in the middle of the first post that I'm putting down. Interestingly the white bits that you can see are dead mussel shells. This spot has clearly seen some bait before and the fish have been feeding on it. So here's the target area. A square box 1.2 metres by 1.2 metres in 11 feet of water by the side of the marker float 13 and a half wraps out from the bank. Moz's target is now to get his leads to land in the target zone. Simple. So Rob's just set in the target area next to 
the float, which is at 13 and a half wraps. I've got Rob's rod here, a torque two and three quarter rod with 18 pound exocet and a four ounce lead, which is also clipped up at 13 and a half wraps. Exactly the same as what the marker float is. So that's the first rod we're gonna chuck out as soon as Rob's got the target area in place. I'm happy with that. I'm surprised how far past the float that, that went, that's mad. So as that's landed, it's landed way past the float. So yeah, it's, it'd be nice to see exactly how, how far past it is when it hits the clip. But yeah, it surprises me how far past that's actually landed. Right, so the second of Rob's rods, exact same setup, other than this has been clipped up at 13 and a quarter. So this is slightly under where the spot is. Make sure I'm dead in position. See, now that to me, seem like it landed bang on where that float is. If anything, just past only slightly though. So again, Rob's third rod, exact same setup again, other than this one's clipped up at 13 and three quarters, so just past the spot. So same position again. So that was way past. So yeah, be interesting to see where all three of them are landed. Me personally, I think it's gonna be the shorter one. By, by looking at it from eye and above surface, I personally think it's gonna be the one that's clipped shortest will be exactly on the spot, but only Rob can tell. The first lad I found was a yellow one, which was just inside the box, right towards the front. It fell approximately 20 centimetres inside and is bang in the middle. Interestingly, this is the one that was clipped at exactly the same distance as the marker lead, namely 13 and a half wraps. I then moved to the back of the target area and look in the silt and found the orange lead approximately two feet behind the tapes. This was the one that was wrapped at 13 and three quarter wraps. The final lead had fallen just in front of the target area. I had to swim around to the front to find it and saw a small mark in the silt where the lead had sunk in. The line is quite tricky to find as it blends in so well, but it was the hole in the silt that gave it away. I got a tape measure out and found it was 85 centimetres in front of the target area. The one that had landed just inside the tape was a foot inside it. I think the conclusion there, Mozer, is that um, nylon definitely has a little bit of stretch in it and you have to take that into effect. What's interesting from my point of view is that you, um, you've you allowed six foot difference, so one was three foot short effectively, one was on the money and one was three foot longer, yeah. and yet when we've gone out there and measured them, there's eight foot potential mm. difference, seven to eight foot between yeah, the furthest yeah, yeah. out and the, and, the, and the closest in. And I think there might be a little bit of how hard you hit it on the cast with regards to how much it bounces back on that yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean... All three of them casts, I would say, were perfect in my eyes. Yeah. You know, the perfect way you would want to hit the clip, yeah. the bounce back and everything was, in my eyes, spot on. Right. Exactly how I would want, want to cast, really. Okay. So, so if you're using mono in the future, let's round this up very, very quickly because there's loads of options on it. If you're using in the mon mono in the future, what will you do? Clip it up to the exact same of the well just past the spot in ten and a half foot of water okay so so what would just past the spot be you given an extra foot two foot oh, i would half a foot i would because you always want to be this That's side of the spot precise, anyway it? though <laughs> well but it's it's amazing how precise it is underwater though yeah. you know when you're seeing it underwater it's yeah. oh, it's difficult because you always want to be fishing this side of the spot so if that if 
in my eyes, I would always clip up to the exact yeah. because then you are always side this side okay. of it. But if you wanted to be on it, let's, let's just have a rough stab at it so we think that as close as damn it, the way that you were casting, if people copy your casting style and you hit the clip right and you do everything right, if in 10 foot of water you were using nylon at 40 yards, if you were to go to the exact and then add a foot, that would probably get your cock on the money. It would, yeah, yeah, it would get you, yeah, definitely. But like I say, I always like to fish this side of the spot, so I would clip it up exactly. Right, so for the next test then, totally different rod, totally different main line. I'm using the Horizon X5 in three and a quarter pound test curve. Also, the main line is a fluorocarbon, and this is a trans car key in 16 pound. So, first rod I'm gonna chuck out is clipped up to the exact same distance as the spot. 13 and a half wraps. So let's get this chucked out and see what results we get. I'm happy with that. Why am I sinking the line? <laughs> I'm fishing. Next rod, exact same setup, but this time wrapped up at 13 and a quarter wraps. So the third and final rod is at 13 and three quarter reps. Always stood in the same position. Way past in my eyes that. So that was the longest rod and I can't help but feel that that was way past. So fluorocarbon is as closer to braid as you can possibly get. So I would imagine that the rod that's clipped up at the exact same distance is bang on the money with this. Dropping down the target zone, I immediately saw the orange lead in the zone just towards the back. Interestingly, this was the one that was wrapped at 13 and three quarter wraps. Moving to the front of the target zone, you can see two other leads. This is the yellow one, and this is the white one. Strangely, the white one had fallen slightly closer to the target area, when the reality of it is it should be further away. The yellow lead was wrapped at the exact distance of the marker lead, and the white one wrapped at three feet shorter. But you can see here that the white one is closer to the target than the other one. Now this got us thinking. Let's just whip down to the front of the, uh, the, front of the box here? there. And look, they're both outside of it. One of them's fallen, I don't know, I think it's 80, 85 centimetres, which is what, just shy of three foot? Which is the one that's clipped up to the exact distance of the spot. What's going on here? But that, if we just pause here, that has fallen two-ish foot yeah. in front of yeah. that front bar. Now, the other one fell the other side of it, didn't it? Yeah. How's so, that? Because it should, if this is shorter. See that? But yet, so the, the shorter one is further than the one that's clipped up to the exact distance of the spot. So in my eyes, they went out sweet. Yeah. All three of them went out sweet. I could have redone them, but they were perfect. You know, perfect, perfect cast. But I've made an error here. So what exactly is the error? we decided we ought to look back at the footage and try and work out exactly what had gone wrong. Have a look at this and see what you think. This is Moz's first cast, the yellow lead. And this is the second one, the white lead. To us, they looked exactly the same, so we superimposed one over the top of the other to see if there was any significant difference. This has never been done before. This is a first as far as casting science is concerned. Once again, we saw no dramatic difference. And just remember that the left-hand mozza is cast in the white lead and the right-hand mozza is cast in the yellow lead. Let's slow it down and watch it again. 
So at this point, they look very, very similar. The timing is impeccable at this point. You can see there's a slight difference on the left hand where possibly it was released early or possibly it was the power put through the cast. As the rod comes back up again, you can see that they are very, very close until the left hander is held slightly further back than the right. These are tiny differences, but ones that might matter. If you look closely, you can see that the right hand lead lands a split second before the left hand lead. We felt this was the crucial point. Let's now look at the reverse camera angle using the camera on my head as the leads were hitting the water. Just concentrating on the white lead and you can see that it drops in at a pretty steep angle before making a fairly small splash. Looking at the yellow lead you can see it coming in at much more of an angle and the splash is significantly bigger. We think this is down to the fact that the white lead hit the clip slightly higher in the air than the yellow lead. If we add a tracer line to the cast trajectory, you can see exactly the path the leads travelled before they entered the water. The drop is a lot more vertical with the white lead than the yellow. The splash here is the key giveaway. The white is more Tom Daly, the yellow more Tom Maker. So we slept on it last night, had a really, really good think about it, had a bit more of a think about it. In fact, I dreamt about it last <laughs> night and quite frankly, it's done our heads in a yeah, bit, hasn't yeah. it? So we've decided that what we need to do is some more conclusive tests. So what we're going to do, we're going to cast to the target three times with the exact same kit to see if there's any differences. And what I'm going to do is get in the water, sit just by the side of the float and see exactly where it lands when it hits the water. So I'm wrapping the fluorocarbon rods out now and after seeing the results I'm going to wrap my fluorocarbon rods up at 13 and just over half, so literally 18 inches over halfway. So obviously the spot is at 13 and a half wraps, I'm going to literally add the 18 inches to allow for that tiny bit of spring back. So. That's what I'm going to clip it up at. I know it's not a lot, but these finer details after seeing the results yesterday mean a lot. So yeah, 18 inches with the fluorocarbon. And with the mono, I'm going to wrap them rods up at exactly the same distance as a spot because after seeing the results yesterday, I think, I think it just sorts itself out as it's falling through the water and it will land within the box area. So I'm going to wrap the mono up at 13 and a half exactly and see what happens. All right, so Hughesy's in the water. Got this wrapped up exactly 13 and a half wraps on the mono. So first cast being made with the first rod. Beautiful. Rod number one, done. Rod number two, again, clipped up on the mono at the exact same distance. <laughs> uh, now, what I've noticed there with this is I've got more line back from the rod so there's a little bit more slack there than the other rod even though them two casts were on the money and perfect the white one has fallen shorter because I've got a little bit more line back off of the lead so yeah the white one's definitely going to be shorter of the spot I reckon there even though the two casts were absolutely sweet so third rod on the mono, on the yellow, clipped up at the exact same distance again. Yeah. 
beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Them leads will be in a perfect, perfect line. Well, two of them will. In that zone, I'm adamant they are in that box. But the white one is this side of the pole. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It wasn't hard to find Lee's leads after dropping below the surface as they were all well within the box. Looking closely, the orange lead was bang in line with the marker lead. The yellow was six inches past and the white lead was about a foot back. With a total of 18 inches between these three leads, this was some impressive casting. Moser predicted that the white lead would be short because he got a little bit more slack line back after the lead had touched down. Almost certainly this was caused by the lead bouncing back after hitting the clip, but it was still not that far back at all and well in the zone. It's a very simple conclusion looking at these, that when using monofilament mainline, so long as you're consistent with your casting and you cushion the lead as it hits the clip, you can wrap it up to exactly the same distance as your braided marker rod. So fluorocarbon up next, and I've wrapped this up 18 inches past 13 and a half wraps. So I'm adamant that these are gonna land in that box zone. So we've attached rigs just to make life a bit easier for Husey finding them on the bottom. So let's get this first rod out. <clears throat> Same position. Now, going on yesterday, that hit the clip too close to the water in my eye, so I would have redone that, so I'm gonna redo it. Only because of the results that we found yesterday that if I hit the clip too close to the water and the splash looked like it was a lot, why am I checking the rig, I'm not fishing. <laughs> if the splash is, you know, if there's a lot of splash then that fell back too much, so I'm going to do that one again. That's better. Boom, that's in the box. Second rod, the orange one, clipped up again, just over 13 and a half wraps, 18 inches to be precise. So. in the box. <laughs> so third and final rod on the fluorocarbon about to go in the drop zone so here we go. Boom. Now I'm happy with them if I had to be picky I would say the white one was slightly this side of the spot. Only reason why is it's a little bit slacker than the other two. So I reckon the orange is bang on the money. I reckon the white is slightly shorter than the orange and the yellow is not far off where that white one is either. So that's what I imagine. Once again, I'm very impressed with Moz's accuracy with all the leads falling on the right line. However, only two leads landed inside the box. The orange lead just fell outside the box, two foot further than the marker lead. The yellow was within a foot of the middle of the spot. Interestingly, Moz once again thought the white lead had landed shorter than the others, which it was, but it actually ended up more or less bang on the middle of the spot. It seems that with fluorocarbon, there's more chance of getting bounce back, hence why Lee clipped up 18 inches past. In reality, seeing that the leads have landed towards the back of the box, 18 inches is possibly a little too much, but that's been really picky. All in all, Moz's accuracy was awesome. Potentially the best I've ever seen. So conclusion time, and let's have a look at the differences between nylon and mono. I think the first thing that I've picked up is that the biggest error isn't in the mechanical side of things, it's in the physical side of things. So the kit is fine, it's how you yeah. cast it that's a big difference. Yeah, definitely, it? yeah. You've, you need to be casting consistently and hitting that clip properly as well and for what i've got back from it looking at the splash of the lead that can tell you a massive amount of difference getting the line back as well once the leads hit the bottom 
gathering, you know, if you're gathering a lot of line back, then you're not yeah, on the spot. You're shot. And it's obvious, really, when you think about it, that you can't magic more line from somewhere else. It's in the clip, it's fixed. Yeah. So if you're casting out and you think it's right, but you're going to wind three or four turns on, the chances yeah. are you're falling short. Which I know is obvious to people, but I've been, you know, I've done it. I've been, no, it. yeah, I've done it. I'm holding it and I'm like this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sinking my life. It's but... the, let's hope I'm hitting the clip. I'm hitting the clip. <laughs> you stand back a little bit to hit it. Well, it. You're just falling short. You've yeah, yeah. hit the clip in the wrong place. So let's just have a very, very easy recap then. Um, if you're using nylon, you can clip it up at more or less the same exactly distance, the same, yeah. just be careful that you're not hitting it too hard or too soft. Yeah. And if you hit it too hard, you're going to get bounce back. But actually, what we find is that in deep water, the bounce back cancels itself. Yeah, it? it eradicates itself totally. So yeah, with mono, I would always, always clip it up at the exact same distance as okay. the spot. Fluorocarbon, actually exactly the same. You've just got to be careful how you cushion it. I think so, yeah, definitely. Yeah. You added, what, 18 inches and they were all in. One of them was just on the outside, actually. Mm, yeah. You could probably say, with fluorocarbon at 50 yards, in 11 foot of water, add a foot. Yeah. To be absolutely cock on with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the key thing, guys, whatever you're thinking, the key thing is don't get too wound up in whether it should be six inches, 12 inches, 18 inches. Work on your casting. Because if you work on your casting and you don't hit it too hard and you don't let it bounce back or you're not causing problems with what you're doing, then the gear will be absolutely fine. And if you go to more or less exactly the same distance, give or take a foot, then you're going to be in the drop zone without any shadow of doubt. Make sure you feel it down all right. And if it does, then you'll be on the money.